Dear friends, we welcome you again to the Adventist Roundtable as Dr. Russell Stanish, myself, and Ray DiCarlo will begin to discuss a very important message, and that is evolution and creation. Now, as we open this subject, we must understand that in, in the Psalms 33, 6, and 9, it says, God spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. We don't believe that God needed any long periods of time to do that creation. If we had a God that can speak a world into existence, then we must understand then that the creation of this world in six days becomes a very simple thing for him. To put the, the touches of, the, of his master hand into every bit of creation from the, from the vegetation, the trees, the animals, the birds, the insects, everything was done in six days. Now, Dr. Standish, I mean, uh, in your study of becoming a doctor, I'm sure that you were exposed to an awful lot of this evolutionary ideas that you had to just ignore. I mean, how did you make it through the university and medical school and uh, wading through a lot of, of this evolutionary ideas? Well, I've got to admit that when I went to university, I was anticipating that the professors would produce some very powerful evidences in favour of evolution. I've never been so confirmed on creation than I was after studying <coughs> zoology and like courses in my medical course. The facts were that the professors had no sound evidence to present. I would go as far as saying the most absurd theory that has ever been conceived by the mind of man is the theory of evolution. To suggest that an organism as complex as a human body or any animal or any vegetable as far as that's concerned could come about by random factors from the elements that are in the earth is just beyond anything that could ever occur in the whole history of eternity. I'll just give you one example. You take a simple protein, insulin. I think most of us have heard of insulin. It's a very tiny protein. It's got 86 amino acids and composed of just one side chain. You compare that with many, amino, uh, many proteins that have thousands of amino acids. There are 20 different amino acids that are found within the proteins of the body. It has been estimated that if you put a whole millions and billions of these amino acids together and by random factors they were to combine at the rate of one million every second, the chance of that one small protein molecule forming would be about one chance in 10 to the 80 years, the power of 80 years. Now it's easy to say 10 to the power of 80, but when you think that Stephen Hawking, said to be the greatest theoretical physicist since, Al since Albert Einstein, he's the Luskasian professor of mathematics at Cambridge University, he has estimated that all the subatomic particles in the entire universe, that's in a hundred billion galaxies, the entire observable universe, a hundred billion galaxies, each with ten to a hundred billion stars, that they contain altogether approximately ten to the eighty-five subatomic particles. I just mentioned that to give some indication of how huge a number 10 to the 80 years are. After all, it is said by evolutionists that this earth, at, or I should say the universe, the entire universe, at the very most is 20 billion years. Most say more likely 15 uh, billion years. Now 20 billion years is just 2 times 10 to the 10th. That's all. 2 times 10 to the 10th. And yet, 
the estimate for the formation of one, just one single amino, uh, one single protein, a small one in our body, vastly exceeds that. Now, let me say this, insulin is in life. I've given hundreds and hundreds of insulin injections as a physician. I'm not giving people life. I'm giving them something essential for life any more than when we take sodium or sodium chloride, common salt, into our body. We are eating living particles. Yes, sodium is essential for living cells. Chlorine, chloride, is essential for living cells, but they are not alive themselves. And even if, with all these chance factors, we could put together a, uh, even a single cell, let alone a, an organism, that would not constitute life. We do not have the slightest concept of what life is. It is so complex than the, that the devil has no knowledge of life. So let us understand that to, even if we could create an amoeba, and that is vastly, vastly, vastly beyond any of our capabilities today, and ever will be, we could not give it life, because only God can put that entity of life, whatever it is, and we just don't really understand what it is, into even a single cell. The uh, marvelous part of this is that we have a God, an all-powerful God, an omniscient God, a God who loves so much, and yet a God who can, by his word, make this work. And then the crowning act of his creation was to make human beings. Now, mm. uh, Dr. Stanish, I mean, as we look at the human body, unbelievable, the function of the human body, the heart beating, the blood surging through the arterial systems, uh, and, and then you look at all the glandular systems and uh, the brain and all these things that make us living beings. And uh, for us to believe that somehow, uh, that uh, through a, a through billion years, that God, uh, that God is left out of this creation, and it just was happenstance that it happened. A little piece of protoplasm came spinning out of nowhere and landed in a mud puddle, and out of that came a polywog, and finally it climbed a tree. It is the most absurd uh, theory in all the world when we have the Bible record that God spake and it was done, he commanded and stood fast. Ray, just pass me your cup there. Yeah. I don't know whether we can see this on the uh, television, the video screen, but I've got a uh, mug here. It's got a couple of birds on it. I, I'm not really up on what those birds are, whether they really do exist. A picture of... Uh, what they would call a roadrunner. Yeah, road Is that, that a roadrunner? Mm -hmm. You'll have to forgive me for my desert. lack of American um, bird knowledge. And then there are a couple of cacti plants, four cacti plants. Now, if I was to present this to any evolutionist I have ever met, and I was to say, now look, this came by chance factors. Now remember, this is a very simple thing. It's pottery with some glaze, and it has some random pigments on them, I'm going to call them random, that have just splattered over the years just by chance factors, and they just happen to form patterns that uh, compose these road runners, or at least give us an image of the road runners. It's even remarkable that this brown here uh, just happens to be on the outer edge, it doesn't come in, but that is exactly how the splattering of the pigment occurred. Now there is some water in there, uh, in this mug, that could have come of course by chance factors even though we're inside, maybe the rain somehow beat through and uh, it came into this mug. Now. If I tried to convince an evolutionist that this was an act of evolution or a, a product of evolution, I think they might call in the psychiatrist to see 
whether I needed to be put behind doors and to padlock the door. <laughs> you see, I would not be able to convince a single evolutionist that this extremely simple piece of pottery, this mug, came by random factors. Yes, billions of them didn't compose a mug like this, but this is just the one chance out of billions upon billions upon billions. Now, I believe that there's not a true evolutionist in the world, because if there was, he would have to accept that there was a real possibility that that is where this mug came from. <laughs> but he looks at it and he sees design. He sees design in this mug. He sees something which he knows in his heart of hearts could never happen. And yet if I compare that with the, sing the simplest cell, it is absolutely simplicity personified. I cannot tell you how much more complex an amoeba. I, I get very sad when I hear people talking about amoebas. Do you know what it really means to reproduce by splitting in two as an amoeba does? That is a complex biological process which we do not anywhere near understand. But it happens. Genes are exchanged, a split and a pass from one to the other. Meiosis, mitosis and these various processes, we can see them, but we do not understand. Or the taking in, the absorbing, absorbing of nutrients because that little amoeba has to eat. Now it eats through absorption, but how does that absorption occur without letting out all the fluids that are inside the membrane? And then how is that converted into energy? You see, there are processes. Um, Krebs just received the Nobel Prize in med medicine for his elucidation many years ago of the Krebs cycle. That's only a start to how glucose, for example, is taken into the cell and through a series of complex um, chemical, biochemical steps is converted into a substance called adenosine triphosphate which contains the high energy bonds that we use and produces energy for our body. Now all this came just by chance. They've got to be joking, brothers and sisters. And where did it all come from? We're told today that it came from a big bang. A big bang. Where did the big bang come from? Okay. What do you use it? Well, nobody even stops to think. They say that they can get back to 10 to the minus 43 part of a second. Now you try and think what that is. That is, uh, what is it? Uh, 9, 43, 7. That's one ten million trillion trillion trillionth of a second. Can you think of it? One ten million trillion trillion trillionth of a second after the Big Bang started. That's what they believe their computers will take them back to. I'm interested in that little one ten million, trillion, trillion, trillionth of a second before they started to find the Big Bang. Where did that come from? They say that it was so small, all the energy that was necessary to create these 100 billion galaxies, at least that we're aware of, was to be found in a, an area of space, a volume of space, smaller than a subatomical particle subatomic particle called a proton. All that massive energy, can you imagine? But, but what before? In that one little, oh, such minu minuscule fraction of a second. And in that burst of energy was the potential for beautiful rainbows, the potential for lovely valleys, for human beings for trees, for delicious food, for poisonous seeds, for terrible marshes and mires. 
They all came from that one burst of energy, that life. I tell you, the Big Bang must have a high intelligence. I don't know where we'd put its intelligence quotient if it could have all these and make all these worlds and all this potential and do it in a miserable 15 billion years. I want to tell you, 15 billion years is nothing. It's not even a start to all this. My brothers, my sisters, the foolishness of man. Now, they have just said, as you know, that they have confirmed because they found a little variation in the background microwave. Have you you've been reading that? I'm sure some of you have. The theory said that there must be a background microwave. And they have measured a microwave at about three degrees Kelvin. That means three degrees above uh, temperature absolute. I want to tell you, that's mighty cold. We've had some cool weather here in uh, Eatonville. But I want to say to you, this is a furnace compared with three degrees Kelvin. They found it. And they've been looking for some inequality in it. Because they say we couldn't have these big clumps of galaxies if there was not some um, inequality in that background. And what did they find? That after years of searching and using this special COBE um, satellite that they set up, they say that they've found it. The great discovery is there. And it's a difference of three millionths of a degree. Now, I don't know about you, but I suspect that our instruments could show a difference of three millionths of a degree just by the level of error in the instrumentation. Mm. I wasn't encouraged to read that they had a little, um, they had a whole notebook full of possible errors that could destroy the situation, but that they were able to eliminate all those possibilities. I want to suggest there are probably 10 of those textbooks that they haven't even thought about. And I suspect that sooner or later they will find that that three millionth of a degree will turn out to be just some sort of change in their instrumentation. And even if it were true, then they've got to have to add to that two other theories. I won't go into them, but it's, some of you have heard of the cold dark matter. It's never been proven. And uh, so they've got something that's unproven that has to be accepted if we're going to accept that this three millionth of a degree accounts for what we see. I don't want to go into too much of the details, but I want to say, dear brothers and sisters, in the beginning, God created the Amen. heaven and the earth. Amen. Mm. Now, Russell, you used the cup. Now it's my turn. Yes. Now, I've got a watch here, and um, uh, I want you, I'm going to put it in the cup, and just suppose that, that I had disassembled this thing, and it was all in pieces. And I, I put it in the cup, and I, I believe in evolution, and we start to do this with the cup. How many millions of years do you think I'd have to shake this cup before that watch went back together? It would be an impossibility. Right. And uh, I think that what we must understand is the theory of evolution is really a, a, not a theory at all because it has nothing to back it up. Theories have to have some, su some substance to it. But uh, I see in evolution there are so many, so many loopholes in which they try to, to substantiate themselves. It's like the carbon-14 method. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, they reevaluate that. It seems like almost every year they're trying to find a, uh, a little different way that they can prove their positions. I think of years back, I mean, they, uh, they had a glacier, the Mendenhall Glacier in Alaska. Um, and... Uh, they, uh, they had always said this glacier had to be millions and millions of years old. And uh, a, a part of the glacier slid off. And underneath, to their surprise, they found a, a, a forest. And, of course, the scientists immediately rushed in and thought, well, they're going to put their carbon-14 on this and prove that, it was, uh, that that forest was millions of years ago. And they found out it was, you know, uh, less than 1,500 years ago. And... Uh, it's like the, 
they, they, that uh, Rose River in Texas where they found a, uh, a three-toed dinosaur in footprints. And um, they, uh, they had always placed the, th uh, the three-toed dinosaur as possibly 15 million years ahead of man. Now they've got uh, limestone uh, slabs with a, they've got footprints, and they've got little footprints, and then they've got bigger footprints, and then they end up with a footprint about 20 inches long, and uh, so it looks like a family, and right beside this, these, these giant footprints are three-toed dinosaur tracks. I remember reading years ago that a, a, a scientist from the uh, New York University uh, heard about this. He came out and walked, spent a day walking around looking at these footprints because there's slabs of them uh, in, this, in this river. And uh, there was one thing, he, he didn't have a choice hardly. Uh, it was either throwing out all his, his research that he'd done all his life, or he was looking at it and say, you got a, a fake set of footprints, and that's what he said. He went back to New York, said, you got a fake set of footprints. He could not accept that a three-toed dinosaur and, and, and man's footprints, especially when you look at a 20-inch foot, I mean, you know, to, to substantiate a giant, I mean, you'd have to have a 20-inch foot. Mm -hmm. And that's what God created. He created a giant. I mean, some have told us that if uh, Adam was twice as tall, because uh, the Bible says there was giants in the land. And uh, when you, uh, Ellen White makes it very, very clear that uh, the size of man in the creation was much larger than and we have any, any man uh, living today. And then if you put man as twice as big, as, as man today, and let's say that would be uh, the average, that a man today, let's say give him six feet tall, that means that if, he, if he's twice as big, that means he's 12 feet tall. That means that now he, he's not now only twice as tall, but he's twice as wide and twice as thick. A mathematician told me that means he could weigh around 1,800 pounds. So possibly that, that footprint there in that limestone in Texas, a 20-inch footprint means that that man probably weighed much over a thousand pounds at least. Mm. And uh, as we look at all of this, we must understand that as we come to the flood, then there is only one way that we can, uh, we, uh, honest way that we can come up with any type of solution. That this world it was perfect and man ruined it and because of sin, God was forced to bring a flood upon the world, according to Genesis. He brought a flood upon the world and destroyed that perfect world. And what we're pumping out of the land today, thousands of feet down on the earth, is the results of that flood. Uh, the, the coal and all the, oil. Uh, all the oil that's coming out today is nothing but what was left of the old world. Right? Yeah, uh, yeah go ahead. Uh, let us just look at the matter of the so-called evolution of sexual differences. Can you imagine what use natural selection would be in the development of the male ability to produce a sperm or the female ability to produce an ovum until there was a man and a woman together who could reproduce? You see, why would the ovaries or the testicles form if there was not someone of another sex? There would be no so-called biological advantage. They would be just uh, wasted organs. Mm -hmm. If we're going to deal with such matters as, the, um, as natural selection, there would be no purpose in those developing. And there's so much to do with the ability of a, an organism. Let's take the, the female, for example, although it's the same in the male. You've got to have the pituitary gland producing follicular stimulating hormone and luteinating hormone. And uh, when babies are born, of course, prolactin. They, we have to have a function for the pituitary gland. And that has to be functioning. We have to have all the anatomical factors of a womb of a fallopian tube, uh, of an ovary. 
Now, unless there was a parallel development of male and female at the same time, then even if a man developed fully with a sexual capability, unless a woman um, was evolved in a period of about 30 years, because that is about the period of um, fertility in a woman, then he would die and that would be the end of the race. You see, it couldn't be something that was happening over a whole period of time. It is absolutely impossible, whether it be in an animal or in a human, that there could be, in the matter of about 30 or 40 years, the development of a sexually efficient male and a sexually efficient female. And if there wasn't in a 30 year period, then if one of them came into existence somehow, it would not be able to reproduce. Certainly a human being can't just divide in two and produce another human being. The whole matter of the development of the two sex is beyond anything that evolution could even begin to explain. And you will never find a satisfactory explanation of how two sexes of the same uh, gene came onto the earth at the one time and within a, such a speck of so-called evolutionary time. It is foolishness, absolutely, totally foolish. Unless we have reproduction, then we lose the species. Sir Julian Huxley, the great uh, British, so-called great British scientist, he figured out, and I really don't understand what his uh, method of figuring was, but his figuring was that the chances of a horse forming by evolution was one in ten to the three million. Now I just told you that according to Stephen Hawking, the number of subatomic particles in the entire observable universe with those hundred billion galaxies amounted to ten to about the eighty-five or eighty-six. Now that is about the biggest number I can give you any idea of because we can't think of anything bigger. There's nothing more in the universe that we can think of larger than, than the number of little subatomic particles in the entire universe. But you know 10 to the 86 is such an infinitesimal speck of 10 to the 3 million that it isn't even worth considering. You could lose it and you'd still have 10 to the 2,999,915. <laughs> you see, so it's hardly worth, worth even mentioning. And yet that is the entire subatomic, or subatomic particles, number of subatomic particles. And if we got a horse, what use would that be? It's a stallion, we'll say. <laughs> if a mare hadn't also been uh, developing uh, all those years and all that time, what would be the use? And what if grass hadn't evolved? They'd have nothing to eat or the sort of atmospheric conditions that bring water to the earth. You can just go on and on and on. Brothers and sisters, this is the greatest hoax that has ever been put upon mankind. By professing themselves wise, the scientists of this world are the greatest fools in the whole history of eternity. Amen. The greatest fools Amen. in the whole history of eternity. Amen. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth. Amen and all that in the midst. Yeah, that's true. Ray, you've been quiet. Yeah. <laughs> well, I just uh, uh, very much appreciate what has been stated thus far, and I, I think that um, one particular aspect that I want to take creation or evolution uh, to, uh, that very, maybe very few people really even understand. I mean, when we talk about creation or evolution, we, um, we need to understand the scientific aspects uh, of uh, that's involved but very few people really see or even understand the fact that evolution and creation have a direct relationship to redemption absolutely a direct relationship right. and you know it's interesting in uh, when you find the the creation story there in Genesis 1 and of course what all the things that God had let me say this if, if we don't have a God that created the world we don't have a God that can re recreate us uh, exactly Absolutely, and, sure. 
And uh, when you look at Genesis chapter 2, there, of course, it's summarizing the, the creation story of Genesis 1. And, of course, it's talking about the, the Sabbath. And I want to read a couple of passages here. It says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work, which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. The Sabbath becomes the very significant aspect of, uh, of God creating the heavens and the earth. In reality, when you look at Exodus 20, 8 through 11, and other parts of the Bible, you, you find that the Sabbath is a memorial that God is the creator of the heavens and the earth. And, uh, and that uh, every Sabbath day that comes, every Saturday, of course, the Sabbath falls on, every Sabbath day that comes, we who observe the Sabbath the way God would have us to observe it, in reality, are reminded that God created the heavens and the earth, that he is the great creator of mankind. But, but not, not only is God the creator of mankind, the Sabbath, according to Ezekiel chapter 20 and 12, the Sabbath was also a sign of sanctification or recreation, as, uh, as Ron, you just brought out there. And it's interesting to see the relationship between the two. The fact that God created the heavens and the earth in six days. And the Sabbath became the memorial upon which ref we reflect on the fact that he is now our creator and of mankind. The Sabbath then becomes also a sign or a memorial that God is the recreator or the savior, redeemer of mankind. Now, there is a direct relationship between the two. No question about it, between creation and redemption. The Sabbath is the connecting link between the two. Now, if you really want to see the significant factor between the two, in order to understand really the, sab the relationship between the Sabbath, between creation and, uh, and redemption, we have to understand what the Sabbath meant in relationship to creation. And, of course, this is when the Sabbath was introduced uh, after the end of the creation uh, story. How did God create the heavens and the earth? How did that come to pass? Psalm 33. If you look with me there in your Bibles to Psalm 33, you see the classic Bible text being used here as the, as the psalmist records for Psalm 33, and there in verse 6, it says, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Then in verse 9 it says, For he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. The moment God, the moment God speaks, he creates. You see, God's word has within itself the very creative power to produce what it states. God said, Let there be light. And my friends, the moment God spoke, there was light. Light did not evolve. Light was created by the word that God spoke. And, you know, it's interesting, Russ, you, you, what you bring out, I really appreciated some of the scientific aspects you brought out because in reality, let's be honest, it takes more faith to believe in evolution than it does in creation. Yeah, I mean, it's impossible when you, when you compare the two, when you realize what's involved between the two, my friends, it takes more faith to believe I'd in that. say it doesn't take faith, it takes crass folly. That's what <laughs> I would say. Absolutely crass folly. That's, true. That's right, Russ. I, you know, and, and this is really, you know, you wonder, uh, my friends, I, I want to say that in Hebrews 11.3, it tells us that we by faith accept the fact that God created the heavens and the earth by his word. That's how we accept it. I cannot explain it. There's no man on the face of this earth that explain how a God in the heavens, by merely speaking, that's all he did, by simply speaking, created something out of nothing. Hmm. Now, this is how God created the heavens and the earth. Now, the same way that God created the heavens and the earth is the same way he recreates a clean heart. In hmm. Psalm 51, there in verse 10, David penned those beautiful words. He said, Cre he's talk it's a prayer of repentance and confession to God. He says, create, notice what he says, create in me a clean heart. 
Notice that when David is describing about redemption and salvation, he's talking about creation. That God, as he created the heavens and the earth, also creates a clean heart. And he does it by the word, by the word of God. Now, I want to show you the fact that, friends, many people need to realize that the new covenant experience, there in Ezekiel 33, verse 26, also in Hebrews chapter, uh, chapter 10, verse 16, and Hebrews 8, verse 10, talking about the new covenant experience where God said he'll give you a new heart and a new spirit. My friends, that's based on creation, not evolution. Many people feel that they gain uh, victory in Jesus by an evolutionary process. Victory in Jesus is not evolutionary. Victory in Jesus is a basis of creation. My friends, you see, God promises through the word that he can keep us from sinning. Jesus makes a promise. He says, I promise you I can keep you from sinning. Now listen, my friends, just as God created the heavens and the earth, by merely speaking the word only, God can create victory in our lives by the word only. If we'll by faith accept what God has said, he will at the moment of speaking to us create what he has promised. My friends, let me tell you, and, I, and, and, and uh, brethren, you can testify to this fact as, as uh, you have come across it many times. But it's amazing how that we believe. For example, and I'll give you an example of evolutionary process of, of victory over sin. Some people say, well, I've lost my temper, and I'm just using a, a hypothetical situation to illustrate my point. But I think you'll uh, understand what I'm saying. Some people say, well, you know, I I've, uh, I've, uh, have a bad temper. And uh, I lost my temper, say, ten times uh, last month. And let me tell you, for some people, they lose their temper for ten times one month. It's been a miracle. Mm -hmm. but, um, but they say, well, ten times I've lost it, you know. But the Lord is, is still with me, praise the Lord. And, and then they can say this, and three, four months go by. And now they say, well, now I'm down to seven. <laughs> I'm down to seven now, seven. God's given me victory. And, and then, it, then another six months, to eight months go by, and then they say, well, now I'm down to five. I'm down to five, and another year rolls by. Now they're down to three. Another two years go by, and now it's finally down to one. And finally, six more months, they went to zero. Jesus, they say, has been giving me victory. They call that sanctification. Friends, listen, that's evolution. You evolved into victory. God nowhere teaches in the Bible or the spirit of prophecy an evolutionary concept of victory over sin. God teaches creation in regard to victory. Amen. God speaks and, you are, and as you yield to that promise, he creates that very promise that he's made to you and my friends at the very moment. You don't have to wait for victory. Brothers and sisters, listen to me right now. You may be going through a serious problem in your life. I don't know what it may be. And it really doesn't matter at this point. But I want to assure you, I want to assure you by the grace of God, I want you to understand, God's word promises that he can give you victory now. You don't have to wait for it a year or two or two months. Now. Friends, you don't even have to wait an hour from now. You can have the victory at this very moment. You know, so, that uh, thought that you just brought out about evolving victory, and I put victory in quotation yeah, that's marks. Right. I have to use that word. I've been told that uh, inverted commas are not, uh, uh, is not a term that's used in the United States. So if I lapse into using the term inverted commas, just interpret that, brethren and sisters in the United States, as meaning quotation marks. Uh, my brothers and sisters in Australia and those in Britain will know exactly what I mean when I say inverted commas quotation marks. There's no victory because right. in reality the situation isn't 10, 8, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 0. This is a situation month by month by so-called victory <laughs> by evolution. It's 10 one month, 9 the next, 8 the next, 7 the next, 6 the next, 5 the next, 4 the next, 3 the next, 3 the next, Three the next, four the next, five the next, six the next, seventh the next, eighth the next, nine the next, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, and so on. Brothers and sisters, that's so-called victory by evolution. That's right. It is no victory at all. You get down, perhaps, yeah. but eventually 
it comes back again and the mm -hmm. sin is even greater than it ever was before. You know, for years I, um, in evangelism, I held a lot of five-day stop smoking programs and uh, I never saw anybody, anybody that ever quit uh, smoking on a, uh, you know, try to cut down half today and a half the next day. It's the same thing. I mean, right. when, they, uh, when they got down to a half a pack, they usually went back up to two packs. That's right. And uh, that's the way sin goes. So there's only one hope for us, and that is that if we really want full victory, the evolutionary theory of victory is, 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 is as <coughs> foolish as the creation evolution, and the only hope that we're going to have victory at all is that full commitment of our life and our mind to Jesus Christ every day and walking carefully with the Lord in full submission to all truth and then we know that there will be victory. You know, have a look at these two beautiful petals that I, I hope I'm not in strife with our decor people here <laughs> that I just took from our flowers. Beautiful petals. You look at the perfection and the intricate pattern that is there. If they came about by evolution, wouldn't we see random colors, just splats mm. of this and splats of that? How many flowers, my brothers and sisters, do you just see messes of color around? And how many do you see beautiful, intricate design, even in this sin-cursed world? You know, that's how it is with the life of those who seek victory by creation rather than victory by evolution. There's no messy splats. There's a perfect design character that God imparts to those who seek victory by his creation. Create in me mm. a clean heart, O oh God. Mm. You know, this, uh, this statement here um, in, uh, that Ellen White has brought so beautifully on her commentary, on Genesis and also in Psalm 33, 6 to 9. And it says, God spoke and his words created his works in a natural world. God's creation is but a reservoir of means made ready for him to employ instantly to do his pleasure. And uh, then this st statement, uh, she goes on, in infinite love, now how great it is, God made the world to enlarge heaven he desires a larger family of created intelligences. All heaven took a deep and joyful interest in the creation of this world and of man. Human beings were a new and distinct order. They were made in the image of God, and it was the Creator's design that they should populate the earth. And then she goes on in these statements. It says, The Lord has given his life to the trees and the vines of his creation. His word can increase or decrease the fruit of the land. If men would open their understanding to discern the relations between nature and God's nature, faithful acknowledgments of the Creator's power would be heard. Without the life of God, nature would die. His creative works are, are dependent upon him. He bestows life-giving properties in all that nature produces. We are to regard the trees laden with fruit as the gift of God, just as much as though we placed the fruit in our hands. Mm -hmm. What you a know, beautiful thought. You know, there's an interesting uh, point, the fact uh, about the Sabbath. You know, had from the beginning now, from the beginning, had every single person kept the Sabbath faithfully, there would have never been evolution. the evolutionary concept taught, That's never. Right. Or there would never be such a thing as an atheist or an agnostic. That's because right. in reality, every Sabbath that came by, everyone would be reminded. Nor an idol worshiper. Or an idol, exactly. Could you worship idols Absolutely. when you're worshiping the maker? That's right, the true God. That's right. right. And again from the, uh, from the prophet of the Lord, man came from the hand of his creator, perfect in organization and beautiful in form. The fact that he has for 6,000 years withstood the ever-increasing weight, uh, uh, ever-increasing, the ever-increasing weight of disease and crime is conclusive proof of the power and endurance with which he was first endowed. Hmm. So, you know, today we've got this idea that, uh, you know, even among our own theologians and scientists, 
who are now toying with the idea that, especially from the geophysics department, I mean, they're toying with the idea, at least some of them, you know, that this world was, you know, uh, much older than, than God has stated it has, and Ellen White has backed up that that statement that it is only 6,000. She makes a number of statements Absolutely. that this world uh, is only 6,000 years old. Now, I was debating with one theologian on this subject at one time, and and he says, I asked him if he believed the world was 6,000 years old, and he, he said, absolutely not. And uh, then he went on to a much higher figure, and I said, but you have been using Ellen White today and misusing her, and she says uh, the world is only 6,000 years old. Well, he said, uh, it's only, a, it's a, she says about 6,000. Well, I said, about 6,000, friend, is not the figure that you're using. And in other places, she says the world is 6,000 years old. That's right. Well, I well, she even mentions uh, in one place where in the millennium, she says for 6,000 yes. years, the tempter, for 6,000 years, the tempter was there tempting men to sin. So to say that that is not accurate is of course a perversion. I know at least 32 times, and I think there are more than those, where Sister White either identifies 6,000 years or approximately 6,000 years as the age of the earth and 4,000 years at the time of the, uh, at the, of the first coming of Christ, which is town amount to the same thing. Look, if Sister White, under inspiration, said it once, that should be sufficient. Amen. But today, Amen. many of our men Amen. believe that they know more than God. Yes. This is a sorry, sorry situation. This is the thing that uh, this is the thing, Russell, that bothers me in regard to this: the fact that what we have is a, uh, a total disregard for the spirit of prophecy. The 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 fact of uh, uh, the servant of the Lord has has made it so clear. Uh, my friends, it, and I agree with uh, uh, Russell Standage, if only one person or one statement from Ella White was made, that should be sufficient. And you know, here's the, here's the bottom line. Let's be honest with ourselves. The fact is, my friends, that just because people cannot figure out this mystery of creation, how it, you know, this process came through, they, they believe that, uh, that just because they can't figure it all out, it cannot be true. And, and again, that's a very faulty premise to work off, especially in relationship to God. My friends, God is a mystery in himself. I mean, we don't even know how, how, all these things that came about. And, uh, but we must accept them. Once again, I have to go back to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 3. By faith we accept these things. By faith we accept the fact that this world is 6,000 years old. Listen, may I just read something from uh, Sister White's introduction to her book, The, the Great Controversy. During the first 2,500 years of human history, there was no written revelation. Mm. During the first 2,500 years of human history, there was no written revelation. Those who had been taught of God communicated their knowledge to others, and it was handed down from father to son through successive generations. The preparation of the written word began in the time of Moses. Inspired revelations were then embodied in an inspired book. This work continued during a long period of 1600 years from Moses, the historian of creation, and the law to John, the recorder of the most sublime truths of the gospel. Add 25 and 16. Does that not give you 41? Yep. 4,100 years. We know John completed yep. the revelation close to 100 AD. This is explicit. And we know that there are now since that 4,100 years, there's close to 1,900 years that have transpired. Right. It is so plain. It is so clear. And to misuse Sister White and ignore clear statements like this is to tell those who are listening the following statement i have no faith in the writings of the spirit that's of prophecy right. absolutely that's right now is before we close this up 
recently there has uh, been discovered which seems with great evidence that of Noah's Ark. Uh, Ron Wyatt, who I know very well, has made many trips to Arad, and now they have, uh, they have, through the help of the Turkish government, they have made a park and a highway going out to this thing. It's all, they even put test holes down into the rock and found out there is rooms down there. They have laid it all out and shown that it is uh, to show that that was a magnificent boat with the same dimensions that are given in, in, the, in, the, in the Word of God. And I believe that there, without a question, when we began to see that on the very mountaintops are some of the very lowest of life in the, 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 the some of these very small um, interverts that now are there on the top of the mountain and now they say that the, it started down way down below and they don't have any explanation how those those little uh, beginning uh, invertebrates, invertebrates how they ever began and how they could get on top of the mountain. Yeah. Mm. Well, uh, whether the ark is found or not, it does not destroy the fact That's right. that the Bible says there was an ark and there was a worldwide flood. Furthermore, we have to understand that the Bible foretold that in the last days they would be willingly ignorant mm. of the flood. And what I see in science today is a decided godless ignorance of that which is so evident to the, the view of any unbiased person that there was a worldwide flood, that it covered the entire earth and it destroyed all those dinosaurs that uh, we are concerned about, or at least the vast majority of them. And as a result, this is the reason why so many thousands of species became extinct. Yeah. May God help us as we look at this important subject of evolution and creation because I believe, friends, that it deals with your salvation and my salvation. If you are going contrary to what the Bible says and what the, the prophet of the Lord has said concerning this important subject, you're in danger. I don't care whether you're a professor of theology, whether you're, whether you're a scientist uh, of some kind, you, you, we, we must stand on the Word of God, and it's only the faith of Jesus that can stand on the Word of God. Mm -hmm. We cannot, if we cannot accept the Bible record, if we cannot accept Ellen White re record of this uh, marvelous creation that God has done, then there is no hope of recreation in our own souls. There's no hope of salvation mm -hmm. at all. May God help us. Let's pray. Russell. Our Maker mm. and our King. Yeah, amen. We bow before Thee. We are the clay. Yeah, mm. sure. You are the grand potter. Yeah, mm. amen. Lord, we acknowledge this. We have no doubt. We know that in six days You made the heavens and the earth. Mm -hmm. Amen. Oh, Lord, we cannot understand the miracle of your creative yeah, power. Man. But we are looking forward to the day when throughout the ages of eternity we will learn more and more of the infinite mysteries of creation. And in learning more of thee and thy works we will grow to love thee more and our joy will increase. This will be a day of days for us we thank you for making it possible. Amen. In your holy name. Amen. Amen. Amen.